In this presentation, the sole purpose is to do a rebuttal to Dr. Russell Kelly's book, Should the Church Teach Tithing? In part one, I will cover his view on tithing from the Old Testament. I will also do a follow-up and cover his view on the New Testament concerning the subject of tithing. Though he does bring out some inconsistencies of tithe preachers, he misses the very heart of tithing. One should consider tithing as an outflow of rendering to God the things that are God's. I will not address all of his points, but most of the main ones. He states his reason for the book. He simply could not find a detailed study on tithing, so he did it himself. Though he does list every reference to the tithe. There is more to the issue at hand. It's the principle of rendering to God the things that are God is the principle that could be found from the very beginning of the scriptures that he misses and I will hammer over and over again. He feels it's unfair that people may be denied a position in a church because one does not support tithing. Actually, there's a lot of things that people can be denied a position in the church because they don't support a particular view. However, if he feels he's right, I'm sure there's a church that feels the same in which he can fit right in. Chapter 1. The tithe is simply 10%. Dr. Kelly provides four common definitions of the tithe. However, number 3 and 4 is what I want to focus on. The third definition is very simple. 10% of one's gross income. The fourth is his definition, and I quote, The full tithe was given to the tribe of Levi first in exchange for his loss of land inheritance in Israel, and second, because of his servant service to his brothers in the Levitical house of Aaron, who alone served as priest. A tenth of the first tithe was in turn given by the Levites to the priests who minister at the altar, unquote, page 8. One of the common overlooked facts of tithing is that it teaches discipline and putting God first. How does one put God first if one gives as they feel like it? Here's a natural example. If someone has a goal to buy a house or a car or any other big investment, do they put aside as they feel like it, or do they consistently put aside a certain amount every paycheck so much to reach their goal? If one is so engulfed in having the latest fad like a new smartphone, the tablet, computer, shoes, clothing, whatever, and then gives God a free will offering, one may only have a few dollars or lose change left to give to God. By setting a certain amount aside from each paycheck, it forces one to be Discipline and be a good steward of what God has blessed you with. Matthew 6 21, Jesus states, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. I really would suggest that you don't give the world your whole paycheck and give God your crumbs and think that the Lord will say, Wow, I really appreciate you putting that quarter in the offering as you're drinking a five dollar coffee from Starbucks. Next, though there were many occupations, only the farmers and herdsmen tithe. Quote, also strange as it may seem, scriptural tithing was only intended for a society sustained almost wholly by agriculture crops and animal herds. End quote. Page 8. Okay, for the sake of argument, let's say he's totally right on this. Here's my response. This is why we do it differently in the New Testament. Uh, we're not mainly alchiculture and herdsman society anymore. There's so many different kinds of trades, and that's why it's different. However, I believe there was a hidden wisdom in the way God did the tithe in the Old, Old Testament. No matter what line of work a person did, there are two things that were always needed. Food and clothing. Food and clothing came for what? Two things. The farmer's crops and the herdsman flock. I believe that since God gave Jacob wisdom concerning his wages with Laman, Genesis chapter 30 verses 37 through 43, and since Jacob would be the father of the children of Israel, then why is it so hard to see that God gave the farmers and herdsmen wisdom 
awesome. Think of it like a business. I mean, God understands economics. It's okay. I will give you an example of something that they probably learned to do in which though, even if they were the only ones that paid tithes, others unknowingly paid the difference. You're saying, what? Here's how. Suppose a herdsman would normally sell a sheep for $100 each. He knows the 10th one he would lose $100. So why would he want to sell sheep if he can sell tables and not have to lose any profit on the 10th table? Here's how. If he sold nine sheep, he makes 900, but the 10th he loses 100. Instead, he sells the nine sheep for $112 each. He makes $1,008 total. He gives the 10th sheep for a tithe. He simply passes on the cost to those that buy from him. Now, since everyone needed food and clothing, Everyone was, in a way, involved in giving. That was simple. That was the simple, eternal principle of rendering to God the things that are God and God giving them wisdom in a roundabout way. That is why tithing should be taught. It is a way to teach putting God first. Chapter 3, Jacob's Tithe. Basically, Dr. Kelly states that his tithe was based on some rash vow and had no real place to give it. He misses the whole point. Jacob's grandfather paid the first tithe, and he probably learned the tithe from him. I don't see it as a rash vow, but as a response to an incredible encounter with God. Dr. Kelly dismisses it, even though both of these references are a type of the tithe for the New Testament believer. Here's how. The tithe of Abram speaks of who it was to be given to, while the tithe of Jacob speaks of the place which it is to be given to. He vowed to tithe at Bethel, which means the house of God. What we can say for sure is that his descendants did tithe hundreds of years later. In fact, Bethel, the place where he vowed to tithe, God commanded him to go back there later on in Genesis 35. It would be right smack in the middle of the future promised land where his descendants did tithe. Both of these texts seem to be out of place. I agree. They would point to a different priesthood that would have a different pattern that would not proceed from the sons of Levi. That's why they seem out of place. It's a different pattern. Chapter 4, Numbers 18, The Tithing Ordinance. Quote, Numbers 18 is the exact legislative wording of the ordinance which includes tithing. Just as any person studying the history of, of any subject should begin at its origin, even so, any legitimate study of tithing should logically begin with the precise wording of the ordinance itself. End quote. Page 32. He spells out how the tithe worked. The people would bring the tithe to the Levites, but it was not necessarily the best, but it was the tenth. Then the Levites would take the best of the tithe, give it to the priest. The Levites did not have restrictions on where they can eat it. However, the priests did. Quote, priests were given heave offerings, first fruits of the land, the firstborn of clean animals, vow offerings, and redemptive money for firstborn of men and unclean animals end quote page 37 there was a temple tax and other means used to take care of the upkeep of the temple thus the new testament does not have a temple tax or redemptive money concerning the firstborn and thus why would god place these taxes tithes and offerings and a host of other requirements as a system of financial support for the old testament yet in the new testament it will only be as a christian feels like it is not god a god of order that we are under grace whatever happened to render to god the things that are god's to those that claim it's all free will offerings fail to see what happened at the be very beginning of the church in the book of acts they gave sacrificially and yet years later they were still in need that is why a consistent support 
through the tithe is so important. The book of Acts proves the importance of consistent giving. Though they gave up much, including lands and homes, etc., the Apostle Paul would still be asking for a special offering to help the poor in Jerusalem. If 10% is wrong, then what percent is right? If there's no percent that's right, then why does God command us to be good stewards, but with no parameters in which to follow? Should not all Christians try to be consistent with prayer, reading the Bible, fellowship with other believers? If so, then why not in our giving? Does not the scripture speak of in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your heart is not open to the tithe, then where is your treasure? He mentions that the people never gave to the priest directly and that both the priests and the Levites did not have an inheritance in the promised land because the Lord was to be their inheritance. But I believe something, though I can't prove it, that the Levites and the faithful priest had a special inheritance in heaven. You can look in uh, the book of First Peter concerning our inheritance, which is laid up in heaven for us. Chapter 5, Holy to the Lord. Quote, These things were holy because they, like the tithe, belonged to the Levitical priest under the Mosaic law. They were not holy because of any inherent eternal quality. Page 43. Another quote, Since God is holy, the things he describes as holy under the law are holy in the context of that law. However, it is clear that this does not mean that everything under the law is an eternal moral principle to be observed beyond the end of the old covenant. Page 44, end quote. However, the principle that the tithe is derived from is this, Dr. Kelly, render to God the things that are God. Even in the first verse of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, that phrase is taken from a Hebrew word that has also been translated first fruits. Strong's number H 7225, quote, the first in place, time, order, or rank, especially of first fruit. Strong's talking Greek and Hebrew dictionary. God desires to be first and that we would set apart unto him that which is his. That principle is to simply render to God the things that are God's. That principle was in the very first verse of the Bible, in the garden, and continues throughout both testaments. The tithe is simply the fruit or an outflow of expression of rendering to God the things that are God, just as first fruits were, just as the firstborn was, and even other things that we are acknowledging God as first place in our lives. Chapter 6, No Inheritance. Basically, the Levites and the priests could live somewhere, but they could not own any personal property since the Lord was their inheritance. In the New Testament, the Bible speaks of having an inheritance laid up for heaven for us. Though I cannot prove it, I do believe, as I said before, that the faithful Levites and priests will receive a greater inheritance than others, and I believe they'll see it in the New Jerusalem. Dr. Kelly believes that the modern preachers should be with the poor. Though some are, I don't agree with his conclusions. The New Covenant is a better covenant in which Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law, and he bestows on us his bountiful grace. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 from the New Living Translation says this, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Chapter 7, How Much is the Tithe? In this chapter, Dr. Kelly deals with three tithes. And yes, there are three in the Old Testament. 
One is the standard tithe that the people gave to the Levites. And then in turn, the Levites gave the best of that tithe to the priest. The second tithe was for the Feast of Israel, which all did partake of and rejoice together. It is the third tithe that's a bit tricky. Every third year, a tithe was given to the poor. What is not clear is whether the tithe that went to the feast were suspended that year or not. So the point that Dr. Kelly makes is this. Since there was more than one tithe, well, why doesn't the church do the same? Since the second tithe is eaten by all, then why is that not done today? Finally, where are their instructions on the third tithe for the poor? My response is simple. One, the New Testament is a totally different priesthood. Most Christians don't celebrate the seventh feast of the Jews, except maybe some Messianic Jews, though I feel all Christians should learn about them, just like they should learn about tithing. Even if they don't believe it, there are principles that need to be learned from the scriptures, just like the sacrifices, even in the Levitical system, point greatly even in the New Testament. For even the Apostle Paul himself spoke of his service as a drink offering. Now, the attendance to these three feasts were mandatory back then, but not today. Since we don't celebrate the seventh feast like the Jews did, then the purpose of that tithe has been fulfilled. However, we have the Lord's Supper that is of most importance in the church. As far as the third tithe for the poor, we see that in the New Testament, it was done by free will offerings. One particular offering was a year in the making. Today, the poor on welfare do not have to wait three years or even a year like the early church did, but every month they get a set amount. Yes, it's different today. It goes from three years to a matter of months, weeks, or days. And yes, in the long run, it is better. Today, though we deal with electric bills, heating, oil, gas for the car, insurance, medical, dental, eye care, and a host of other things they simply did not deal with back then. So that is why the tithe is different today. And thank God it's not every three years before you can get help. Chapter 8 tithe was only in the promised land. Dr. Kelly points out that during the 40 years in the wilderness, the children of Israel did not tithe. Only in the Holy Land were they to tithe. If they were to leave that land, they were no longer to tithe. He also mentions of a rest of the seventh year and the year of Jubilee for the land. Thus, there would be no tithe during that time. My response is simple. The time in the wilderness, God fed them with manna. Next, the New Testament focus is not on the land of promise, for no Christian is allotted a piece of holy land, but that we fulfill the call of God in our life and that we are citizens of heaven itself, where our future inheritance is for all believers. The new covenant, Dr. Kelly, is not based on the Holy Land and how we live one way in the Holy Land and one way out of Holy Land, but Christians as a holy temple is our focus, and thus the Christian prays, Thy kingdom come in whatever land we live. Second, giving a rest of the land is based on farmers and not on all the different occupations of today. That's why the tithe should be continual. That's why the tithe is different in the New Testament. Chapter 9, The Poor Did Not Tithe. Dr. Kelly talks about the poor did not pay tithes, but received from the tithes. In fact, the corners of a field were not harvested in order to leave it for the poor. I have no issue with this. His point is, if the poor of those days did not tithe, neither shall those on welfare today tithe. Dr. Kelly, let's be honest. There's a difference between those poor of the children of Israel and those poor, for example, living in the United States. Here's how. The poor of the biblical era were not only poor, but had no consistency to speak of. In fact, you state, quote, in conclusion, since the poor were not in possession of land, end quote, page 65. Look, one on welfare may be poor, but there's a consistent flow to supply their needs. And they do live somewhere, maybe not the best place, whereas 
The poor of the children of Israel didn't have that. Remember, the tithe to the poor was every third year and not once a month like those on welfare. So let's try to bring this in better perspective of how they lived then and how we live now. Chapter 10, The King's Tithe. Since the government was so different than ours, I see no reason to debate this chapter. Basically, the king could take a tithe for himself, use it as he saw fit. I have no real opinion either way on this matter. Chapter 11, 2 Chronicles 31, Hezekiah errs in the law of the Lord. Dr. Kelly believes that Hezekiah erred. He placed some blame on the chief priests also. He believes that they wrongly brought the tithe to the temple instead of the bulk to the Levitical cities. So here's a recap of what happened and why Dr. Kelly is so wrong on the issue. In fact, I will quote sparingly from the Bible Knowledge Commentary since they have recapped it so well. Based on the requirements and guidelines of the law, Hezekiah next proceeded to reestablish proper temple worship. He gave instruction concerning the service of the priests and Levites, assigning them their 24 divisions. He contributed animals for burnt offerings for daily, weekly, monthly, and annual sacrifices. And he directed the people to support the priests and Levites. The citizens of Jerusalem and surrounding towns and cities compiled by presenting their first fruits and tithes of their produce of the field crops and livestock and all other goods. For four months, they continued to bring their gifts to the temple. The third month was May slash June, the beginning of grain harvesting, and the seventh month was September slash October, the time of vine and fruit harvesting. The people's gifts were piled in great heaps. In fact, Ezariah, the chief priest, said that the quantities Hezekiah saw represented a surplus beyond what the priests and the Levites needed. So the king ordered that storerooms be prepared in the temple to accommodate the excess. Coroniah with his brother were placed over 10 supervisors whose ministry was to oversee the collection and distribution of these gifts. It was their duty to distribute them to the priests who lived in the 13 towns outside of Jerusalem. Concerning Dr. Kelly and his criticism of Hezekiah and the chief priests, Second Chronicles chapter 31 and Nehemiah chapter 13 both speak of the temple being the storehouse. This is where the tithes were brought to. What is conveniently missing from Dr. Kelly is one verse of scripture. In fact, he stops just one verse before it. I, by just going to the next verse, will destroy his whole argument that he has presented in this whole chapter. For he claims that Hezekiah and the chief priests erred in bringing all the tithes to the storehouse at the temple. But according to the Bible, he did that which is right. Second Chronicles 31.20 from the New Living Translation says this, In this way, King Hezekiah handled the distribution throughout all Judah, doing what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord his God. Chapter 12, Nehemiah and the Content of Malachi. The tithes are restored. In this chapter, Nehemiah, who is the governor, basically talks and restores the order of the Levites and priests. Though Dr. Kelly stresses that the Levites and priests ministered about twice a year, it's not that way today. That is why tithing is not meant to be the same as in the Old Testament. That is the content of Malachi, for most of the tithes by the people were collected by the Levites from their farmland communities. The Levites in turn gave a tenth of the tithes that they collected from the people and brought them to the temple for the priests. What this passage, Nehemiah 1037, is not clear on, but Second Chronicles chapter 31 is, is once the priests take their portion of the tithes, what do you do with 
the tithes that remain. And where do you store it? This particular passage doesn't say it. Nehemiah 10.37 says, Moreover, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, the first of our ground meal, of our grain offerings, of the fruit of all the trees, and of the new wine and olive oil. So far, Dr. Kelly agrees with that. And all that right there is not the tithes but are under the heading of offerings however the next part of the verse and we will bring a tithe of our crops to the levites for it's the levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work now some other translations says for they the levites collect the tithes another one for it is the levites who collect the tithes in these translations, it is clear that the Levites collect the tithes from the people. What Dr. Kelly has erred in greatly is by the wording of the King James that states, quote, that the same Levites might have the tithes in the cities of our tillage. He has assumed to believe that this passage is speaking of where most of the share was automatically left in the Levitical cities. However, all he has to do is go to chapter 13 of the same book where Nehemiah orders the tithes to be stored in the storehouses at the temple. So that would seem to be where all the tithes would be stored as we go to the book of Malachi since he believes this is the content of the book of Malachi. In fact, when we look at Nehemiah chapter 13 in verse 12 and 13, it says, Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the storerooms. I set treasures over the storerooms. Where, where were these storerooms or treasures? Well, it's in the temple. First Chronicles 9.26 and also First Chronicles 28.11. It goes on and mentions that the priest, the scribe, and the Levite were assisting them with a couple other people mentioned. They were counted faithful and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Thus, according to Nehemiah 13, the temple was like a big distribution center and there was a priest, a scribe, a Levite, and a few other men that oversaw the matter so that that the portions that the Levites and singers got will not be neglected as what what happened earlier and that's how Nehemiah corrected the matter however the book of Malachi which is around the same period but maybe not exactly probably within 10 15 years deals with the issues that the tithes were not being brought to the storehouse yet dr. Kelly claims that the priests were fully to blame so as we go to the book of Malachi keep this in mind if the same thing happened in the book of malachi where the priest stole the levites portions then consider this if the levites said the heck with this we're going back to the farmlands and then at some point the priests will no longer have any food right i mean <laughs> if the job of the levite was to give a tenth of their tithe that they receive from the people and give it to the priests and decide not to do it, what would the priest do? With that in mind, let's go to the book of Malachi. Chapter 13. I call this the blame on the priest. Dr. Kelly basically states that the book of Malachi was addressed not to the nation of Israel, but mainly to the priests. Thus, the priests stole the tithe from the Levites that were in the storehouse. The storehouse, according to Dr. Kelly, only took care of those at the temple. Those Levites and priests that were not working at the temple were taking care of, of the tithe that was kept locally, according to Dr. Kelly. Kelly. I've already discussed Second Chronicles chapter 31 and Nehemiah chapter 13, which says otherwise. However, to state that the book of Malachi is a rebuke only to the priests is not wise. In fact, the very first sentence of the book of Malachi states, quote, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The very first verse in the book of Malachi telling you what this particular book is being addressed to. Mm -hmm. Now, in this chapter on the book of Malachi, it is the very first verse that destroys his premise for the entire chapter. If the word of the Lord is to Israel, then here's the punchline. This book was written to the nation of of Israel. By the way, in chapter 2 of Malachi, the rebuke is to all of Israel, 
in the treatment of their wives. So now let's just go to chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? By the way, Dr. Kelly always likes to use the word ordinance and say that's basically a certain part of the law, but it was not just by the priest, as Dr. Kelly seems to believe. For all of Israel did the Passover, Exodus chapter 12, verse 2. Let's go to verse 8. Will a man rob God? Uh, notice, Dr. Kelly, it doesn't say priest. If this is directed to a priest, when it say a priest, hmm? yet you rob and defraud me. But you say, in what way do we rob or defraud you? You have withheld your tithes and offerings. Okay, let's just think this through. According to Dr. Kelly, the priest did not tithe. So how can this verse be only directed to them if they did not tithe? Second, the only way the priest got the tithe is when the Levites got the tithe from the people and then the Levites gave the best of their tithe to the priests. So the people did not tithe, then the priests didn't get their tithe. If the Levites did not give their tithe to the priests, then the priests got nothing. However, Dr. Kelly believes that the tithes that were at the temple were stolen by the priests, were supposed to be given to the Levites. In the book of Nehemiah, this did happen but not in the way he implies. Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 7 through 12. Hezekiah says, Hey, when I arrived back in Jerusalem, I heard about Mr. E, evil deed, and reviving Mr. T with the room in the courtyard of the temple of God. I'm not too good at pronouncing some of these names, and that's why I do that. It became very upset and threw out all of Mr. T's belongings out of the room. Then I demanded the rooms be purified, and I brought back the articles for God's temple, the grain offerings, and the frankincense. I also discovered that the Levites had not been given their prescribed portions of food, so they and the singers who were to conduct the worship services had all returned to work their fields. I immediately confronted the leaders and demanded, why has the temple of God been neglected? Then I called all the Levites back again and restored them to their proper duties. And once more, all the people of Judah began bringing their tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the temple storehouses. Okay. After this, and I did discuss this earlier, he sets up a priest, scribe, and Levi over the matter. When the priest did the wrong action, it was corrected. Keep that in mind. The action is not the same in the book of Malachi. Let's look in verse 9. In a number of translations, it's speaking of the entire nation being at fault, not just the priests. From the net translation, you are bound for judgment because you are robbing me. This whole nation is guilty from the etrv version in this way your whole nation has stolen things from me so bad things are happening to you and the king james ye are cursed with the curse for ye have robbed me even this whole nation to me it's clear this book was written to the whole nation of israel and that the whole nation is at fault. However, for the sake of argument, let's continue. Verse 10. The way that God would correct the matter. Verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. First of all, the storehouse was the place where the people would come together and worship and fellowship with other believers. The church is now the New Testament version of the storehouse, as I will show later on in the New Testament. The passage concerning the tithes is referring to the storehouse, which is at the temple and not the Levitical cities, as Dr. Kelly claims. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 13, there was a problem with the priests. If the priest here in the book of Malachi kept stealing the tithes, then why would God only say, bring in all the tithes into the storehouse just so the priest could continue to steal more? If that was the case, like it was in Nehemiah chapter 13, the priest in the wrong should have been dealt with. Yet here, the way the matter is dealt with is to bring all the tithes. 
That would be like saying bringing all the drugs into the warehouse, fully knowing the drug dealers have set up an office and are constantly stealing the drugs. Thus, God would be enabling the priests to steal more. The priests of Malachi were not only to be blamed concerning the tithes, for the text states that this whole nation was at fault. Neither would God enable the priests to continue to steal more. Dr. Kelly if God needed, he could have just told the leaders to stop bringing the tithe into the storehouse. And guess what? The priests would starve. One final note. This passage of scripture has been worn out so much that we missed the point of the passage. If someone were to rob you on a continuous basis of something, would you reach out and bless them beyond measure? God actually made a promise to bless those that were robbing him if they would return unto him instead of thinking of this passage as a curse to those who don't tithe now think of this passage as a willingness of God to give one a clean slate to the nation of Israel it doesn't stop there but he even gives them a chance to try it out and basically is saying there's a money back guarantee in the matter that blows my mind if someone keeps robbing from me i'm not at a level to say hey just stop and i will bless you beyond what you can receive that is huge and even though this is directed to the nation of israel we can see in the new testament the prodigal son he took the inheritance wasted the whole thing and yet there was room for him to come back so I can see that this is almost like an Old Testament love story we just haven't looked at it that way for even though it speaks of cursing in the book of Malachi we see God is willing to open up the windows of heaven and pour upon a blessing upon the nation of Israel how much more today now that we're in the era of grace now, to claim that if one is to tie today is only to be food and clothing, <laughs> really, Dr. Kelly, you've forgotten what you've said earlier. Quote, also, strange as it may seem, scriptural tithing was only intended for a society sustained almost wholly by agricultural crops and animal herds. Page A. Yes, that's the Old Testament. And Dr. Kelly that's why it's different today. The new covenant is not restricted to the nation of Israel. But whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whether you're living in Antarctica, which you can't really do many crops. Hmm? Yeah. New York City and buildings. Yeah. Think about this, Dr. Kelly. God saw this ahead of time, and that's why he would change things. Because the New Testament is not just made for farmers and herdsmen, but for all people and for all races. And that is where you are mistaken. With that said, I plan on doing a rebuttal to his views concerning the New Testament and tithing.